Hey everyone, it's Denise. We are into our third workshop today. Now we're gonna talk about market trends. During our break, we had some really interesting conversation with those who are joining live and they are sharing, they're collaborating, they are supporting each other. And we had another conversation about who can help with social media and marketing. If you are interested, my assistant Deanne is great. She has been really helpful. I'd be happy to introduce you to her. So you can always send me an email and I would be happy to introduce you to Deanne. And I just wanna make sure that everybody decides to just put it out there without worrying about the production value. And I also wanna encourage you to remember to put it out there without worrying about numbers. I have been parts of, I have been guests on podcasts that have huge numbers that have never created any opportunities for me. Two days ago, we did a conversation with a couple family caregivers around the stuffed calendar. That would also be a helpful recording for you guys to watch where we talked about how do you organize all the doctor's appointments. We had a small group. At the end of that discussion, one of the guests was booked on another podcast. So please don't judge numbers and production quality. It's most important that people connect with you because of their feeling about what you're delivering. It's the emotional connection. People connect with the emotions of your work when they feel understood, when they feel relieved, when they feel better. That's what's most important. Okay, I hope that was helpful. So this is not a surprise. We want help. It's also important to remember that help is for the carry and help is for the family caregiver. And oftentimes that's gets that gets lost. And I first figured this out years ago. I was doing a workshop. One of the audience members said, but my wife won't accept help. Now, when you hear that as a presenter, you think, holy Hannah, how am I going to solve that problem? Right? It's very intimidating. And what occurred to me in that moment was he deci was deciding that the only help for him is really help for his wife. If his wife received help, he would be helped. In truth, we all run into situations with our carries where they are not going to receive help. And that's when we have to remember that it's also help for the family caregiver. Help for our carry, help for the family caregiver. And sometimes it's different kinds of help. So I'd love for you to share in the chat room how that resonates with you. For instance, what helps you? What helps your carry? So feel free to share in the chat room your insights about that. This market research came out maybe about 18 months ago. You probably have this thought in your head. You probably hear others say this, but do family caregivers really want to help, want to pay you for help? And this market research says, yes, they do. 80% of family caregivers are interested in paying for products and services to help them. Here's the big piece of it. It has to help them. Family caregivers will invest time and money in what helps them. If it doesn't help them, they won't. It has to help. The same market research had this really, I would say, eye-opening and somewhat upsetting stat. 90% of family caregivers cannot identify a company that stands out in helping them. Wow. 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 Let's think of, about that from a different perspective. I'd love for you to share in the chat room. Think of a different situation and think of a different company that you go to because you know they help you. So for instance, for technology, when I look to buy a phone or a laptop, I go to Apple. 
So to me, for my technology needs, I look to Apple. If I am looking for diversion, if I need a break from the world, I go to Netflix. That's the company I ident identify as helps me with a diversion. Interestingly enough, family caregivers cannot identify a company that helps them. So when they are stressed out and overwhelmed, they do not have an idea of a company that can help them. It's upsetting because family caregivers are struggling so much. It's also an opportunity for us. Within your niche, you can be the company, the individual that family caregivers think of when they need help. Now you can see how important your niche is with this then. It's not every family caregiver, it's family caregivers in your niche know to go to you. Let's take a look at the market. So there's a couple myths that I have been talking about regularly honestly, for 20 years. And I wish these myths would go away. And I think it's important to think through why we have to dismiss these myths. So one of them is family caregivers don't self-identify. And this has been, I believe, particularly damaging in our marketplace. And I believe it's one of the reasons that family caregivers can't identify a company that helps them. Startups have come into our space and have flopped. And when they do a debrief about what their failure was attributed to, they will say it's because family caregivers don't self-identify. That's not why their product or service flopped. It's because it did not help family caregivers. It's because they did not talk about it in a way that resonates with family caregivers. Family caregivers did not perceive that the solution would make things easier for them. The first app that that came out to, to help family caregivers was probably about 12 years ago. And it was an app that you see in various forms now. It's about organizing care teams, organizing information. This app had huge funding through GE, had a lot of support from caregiving organizations. They did this huge splash when they launched the app. Total failure. You know why? Because in order for the app to work, family caregivers had to sit and input data <laughs> that they already had in a different form that worked for them. And that was pen and paper. Family caregivers weren't gonna sit and input data into an app because it did not serve them. It, looked, it felt like a time waster. And I know this because I happened to go to a networking event with one of the app developers and he was adamant. He said, I will never, ever, ever develop another tool that requires family caregivers to input data because they just won't do it because there's no benefit to them. So instead of the startup saying, we didn't use the right marketing message, we didn't develop a product that they wanted, it became, it's the family caregiver's fault because they didn't identify. I mean, isn't that crazy? Who does that? Who does that? So think about Coke. When they have launched different versions of Coke, they haven't said, well, you know what? It's because no one identified as a Coke Zero drinker, and that's why we failed. I mean, no one does that. But in our space, it was prevalent for decades, for decades. It's not the family caregiver's fault if a product fails. It is not. And what happened then is... All we did was repeat and replicate solutions that family caregivers don't want. A waste of money. And then the other one is, this is a common one, and I know that we're all tempted to say this, that family caregivers are hidden or invisible. That means to me, I'm going to say this very literally, that when I was with my parents in a doctor's appointment, I was hiding behind the exam table. Or when they were hospitalized, I was hiding behind the door. I never hid. I was never invisible. It's that the systems aren't reimbursed for helping us. We're not hidden. We're not invisible. We are strong advocates. 
We are out there on a regular basis, ensuring quality of life for our carry and for ourselves. The systems aren't set up to be reimbursed to help us. That's the only reason that, that we have been overlooked. It's not us. We are not hidden or invisible. It's the systems aren't set up to reimburse, to support or help us because there's no reimbursement. There is one now. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But because there hasn't been a reimbursement mechanism for decades, physicians didn't make it a part of the appointment, for instance, to say, what can we help you with, Denise? The hospital system, when they were training me on how to manage my dad's ostomy care, didn't say, What's worrying you about doing this at home? They just said, here's how you do it. <laughs> Here are the supplies. The home health nurse. Well, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. He's in a wheelchair now. We're going to take him out. You're going to take him home. And the home health nurse might show up in 48 hours. Might. Right. Yeah. But they were training me. They were talking with me. I wasn't hidden or invisible. They just weren't getting paid for helping me. So they didn't. It's always been a reimbursement issue. And again, this takes the pressure off of us that we are somehow hidden or invisible. It's not us, it's the systems. It's the systems. If you have any thoughts about those two myths, feel free to share them in the chat room. But I just would really encourage all of us to avoid using those types of phrases. Instead, it's that individuals don't do the right market research to understand how to best help and support us. And the systems haven't been set up to reimburse to support and help us, which is why they haven't supported and help and helped us. It's money. It's money. It gets down to money. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that terrible? But that's what it is. It's money. I wanted to share some ideas around where I think the marketplace is going. If you have tried to hire help, you probably have hit brick walls. It could be that there's a budget to hire help, but the budget doesn't allow you to hire as much help as you'd like because the cost of care is sky high. There was research or stats or data that came out last month that said the cost of home care increased 14% in one year. And that cost, I believe, is directly related to the cost a home care company now has to recruit staff. So what are they doing as a business? They are passing on that cost to the consumer, to the client. There's not enough. There's not enough. So instead, what I think we're going to do is look to hire more family members and friends. In my family, we hired a niece, a nephew, and my sister. I wanted to hire through an agency, and we looked at hiring before the pandemic, and my parents were very resistant. We want privacy. There was a four hour minimum. What are we going to do? What is she going to do for four hours? So we just looked at who was available because of tr a transition in their life and then hired them. We actually do a planning session every month that's free to help family caregivers figure out how can they hire others in the family. It's also becoming much more prevalent in the Medicaid space. So if a carry has qualified for Medicaid, instead of trying to hire help through an agency, the Medicaid waiver program will allow the carry to hire a family member. That is going to be even more and more popular. It's very popular. It will become more and more. It's not easy through the Medicaid waiver programs but that's what's going to happen, I think. I have been thinking through the costs. We often think about the costs to the family caregiver. And feel free to share in the chat room what are the costs to us during a caregiving experience. 
we think about the cost to us in terms of retirement savings, perhaps quality of life, our own health, our own ability to keep a life during caregiving. So we look to our costs as individuals. We look to the cost to an organization, for instance. So there's a lot of stats that show the cost to a company who, when they don't support family caregivers is this amount in terms of productivity, lost time, absenteeism. But there's a cost to our communities too. And I started doing some research around that. And I did a presentation last week on how will we care? And I shared the initial data on that. So you can watch that on YouTube if you're interested in it. Because when we're in a caregiving situation, we fall out of a community. And we fall out of a community after our care has fallen out of the community. And what that means is we're not in a community spending money. So maybe, for instance, I went to Panera once once a week on a Friday and met friends. I don't do that anymore during a caregiving experience. I'm not spending with money within my community because I don't have the time, the energy, and maybe I don't have the money anymore. There's a cost to our communities. And when we have good data around the cost to our communities, we can actually then figure out, well, then how does a community actually do better because they support family caregivers. So if we add support and resources within a community to better support family caregivers, how does that help the community's economy? And that's gonna become big. If you think about how many are in a caregiving experience, whoa, whoa, there are costs all around us. In 2015, I started thinking about how many family caregivers are going to be in the world in 10 years or so. And I started thinking about what would the workplace look like? And I thought, oh my gosh, are we going to just have empty cubes? Because so many family caregivers are in, in the hospital with their care or at home because they can't find or hire help. Oh, I have little balloons floating by my mind. I think it's kind of funny that Zoom does that now automatically. Like if they think you're celebrating something, I wasn't really celebrating that, but Zoom wanted to put some balloons up there. So anyway, <laughs> it's funny. Anyway, I think that we're going to have a situation where the numbers are going to force changes. How we do work is going to change. If a company is smart and that starts thinking through, wow, we have a lot of family caregivers within our organization, they don't necessarily, it's not just remote work that will be helpful. It's flexible work hours. What if we started thinking about allowing employees to work different hours to stagger shifts, so to speak? You know who that helps? their clients and customers who are family caregivers. Because when do they have time to interact with an organization? It could be in the evening and on the weekend. If you structure your business to support your working family caregivers, guess what? You've naturally structured your organization to support your clients and customers who are family caregivers. And then the lived experience now has value. It always did. I guess I should say it has reimbursable value. It always did. In the United States, this is something in the United States, Beth. So this is a little specific to just us. Medicare now reimburses for services provided through trained auxiliary personnel. So trained auxiliary personnel typically are considered to be community health workers, our certified caregiving consultants are the equivalent. And I've been working with organizations and actually with the state of Illinois about what's the training and certification program for community health workers. So it's the lived experience that now is coupled with training that becomes personnel who provide support and services for patients and family caregivers 
and those services are reimbursed through Medicare. Okay, you know what? I just want to mention one other thing. The billing codes are available for any payer to use. Medicare is using them. Any commercial payer could start to use them as well. We have a shortage of healthcare professionals, a shortage of doctors, nurses, home health aides, certified nursing assistants. We have to look at a new pool of professionals who support patients and family caregivers. And that's this pool of trained auxiliary personnel who turn a lived experience into a career. And Laura is wondering if this is through the Medicare Guide model, got the Medicare Guide program. That guide program is specific for persons with dementia and their family caregivers. That is separate. This is a separate service. Reimbursement for community health integration, principal illness navigation is for anyone in the Medicare program. There are qualifying criteria, and it starts with a risk assessment, typically for social determinants of health. So a physician can do an assessment to determine if a patient is at risk because of social determinants of health factors. And then also, a family caregiver is a Medicare patient too. The physician can do a social determinants of health for a Medicare patient who is a family caregiver and determine their stress level because of their caregiving experience is a risk factor for them. Make a referral to a certified caregiving consultant who does a 60 minute assessment and puts care plans together for that family caregiver. Isn't that amazing? Medicare did this. I found out about this last August and then went to every conference and workshop I could think of to make sure I had this right because it seemed like a dream come true. How could this be? And I have tested this out with everybody. Did I get this right? What am I missing? What don't I understand? And it is it is this. <laughs> like I, I tested it. I asked. I researched. It, it is this. It is this. And this is the wave of the future. Because as you guys have been sharing, the navigation system is a nightmare. It's very difficult. When you have a diagnosis of an illness, you do not feel well. And guess what the system requires of you? Energy, <laughs> diligence, commitment. <laughs> they don't make it easy for you when you are ill. So the family caregiver is trying to figure out how do I make this happen? Because my family member is not well. And principal illness navigation helps with that. Care coordination, referrals to community resources. It's amazing. So if you have followed my work on LinkedIn or in my newsletter or are carrying our way, you'll find more information about these programs that are now reimbursable through Medicare and have billing codes that any commercial insurance plan can start to use. So Laura, you can just follow me on LinkedIn, read my newsletters and read anything I posted about in Carrying Our Way. Again, you have to have training. You have to have training. Each state does have certification and uh, training requirements. That's a little bit of a nightmare for me, but I'm working my way through it. But you have to have training. Okay. So now I want you to think about it in terms of your work. So what does your business need to be ready to take advantage of these new market trends? What does your work need? What do you need? And it could be that you just need a push. Okay, so that's our third workshop. So I'm gonna close us out and get ready for our next one. And feel free to share in the chat room any thoughts as we do our transition. And so those who are joining the archive, I'll be back in just a minute.